Good morning. This is the day that the Lord has made. Let us rejoice and be glad in it. Rejoice in the Lord always. Again, I say rejoice. Before we get into the message today, I want to just take a moment and ask each of us, we're just going to pray in our own hearts to the Lord. But let's just thank him for whatever blessings God has given you in your life that come to your mind, your life, your breath, salvation through Christ, the righteousness imputed, the sins forgiven that you can see here. Let's just take a moment. Let's pray. Thank you for all these things, Holy Father, in Jesus' name, amen. All right, I want to welcome you if you're a visitor here today. You've come to part four of a series of sermons I've been giving on the family. We're going to pick it up here today. So just kind of as a brief recap, we talked about parenting and how difficult parenting can be because when the baby comes out, you have full say. You say where they go, what they do. You are responsible to make sure they get fed because they can't feed themselves. You got to clothe them. They can't clothe themselves. You have all this control of what's going on in that little person's life. And over the next 20 years or so, that's going to slide to no control. You are in the process of training somebody to be under full control to no control, and you're teaching them how to live in a way that God would have them live. And so it's a process that we go through, and as we talked about in the beginning of this series, it's not just something that we do in our own personal families. This is what God is doing in the church. We come in as babes in Christ. We don't know anything. We are helpless. He has to save us. He has to give us life. He has to take full control of our protection and provision and everything because we are just helpless. We don't know what salvation is yet. We haven't learned, and God has to reveal to us this new life that we have in Christ. But as it happens, God doesn't want us to just stay babies. He wants us to grow and mature and develop. And we begin that walk with the Lord. And so, so much of the same phases that we see our children grow through as they start with babes and go to mature adults, so it is with us Christians and the things that we have to learn how to do and how to be parents and also how to be children. And so God wants us to see this process, and we see it in our families, and we see it in life, because what is God doing? He is bringing many sons and daughters to glory. When the great creator God came to the earth, and he formed mankind of the dust of the ground, and he made Eve, he was making in his own image and likeness creatures that he was bringing to glory. And so what is it that we've been called to? Not just to be saved, but until we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. And it does not yet appear what we shall be, but we know we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. And everything that we do here as kids coming together to meet, to talk about our Father in heaven, and to speak of his word to one another, is what? So we're all growing up together. And we have kids into our families, and we're growing them up together. And so just a powerful impact of family in our lives. And so we go through this process and these stages of zero to two where basically you have to be at the beck and call of your child. They are completely dependent on you. They're not going to get up and make breakfast in the morning on their own. They've got to have somebody get them up, clean them up, feed them up, and then change them up when they uh, make a mess. So, and then this age two to 12, this is an age where your children are learning and what's happening, there is this assertion of authority that comes in as a parent where you're teaching them the ways and and how to walk and then you have more of this counseling period that comes as they get a little older and so what does the bible tell us to bring up your children in the training and admonition of the lord as we talked about training is a very broad word because it's basically saying whatever you got to do to train the morals the thinking the ways of the child. So whether it's through verbal instruction or through examples or lessons. And so in Deuteronomy 6, it adds to it, it said that these words that I command you, teach them diligently to your children. Talk to them when you sit in your house, when you walk by the way, when you lie down, and when you rise up. In other words, 
this is an engagement. And parenting is an engagement with kids. You are responsible to train your children in the ways of the Lord. And ultimately, this is what God is doing with us. And in relationship with the church, training up in the way to go. So that is what we do as a body, but it's what we do in our families and what you as father and mother, two children should be doing in your household, training them up in the way to go. So the last time we spoke, we went through many different ways that God wants us to train and nurture our kids. Talking about teaching them to read, teaching them to talk, teaching them uh, communication and language, singing to your kids, letting them hear the songs of the Bible, teaching them the word of God, teaching them about Jesus and love, nurturing them, caring for them. This whole process begins when they come out and you start to take care of that child and you talk to them and let them know that you love them and care for them. And you begin a whole process that continues to grow and develop over time. And so... There's so many things. We talked about teaching your children the difference between right and wrong, between yes and no, to teach them where boundaries are, to teach them how to behave in different circumstances and different situations. And so we teach our children all these different things. So pretty perfect, right? You teach your kids and they just do it. Everything works out really well. End of story. I'm done with the sermon and we can go on to something else. But what do you do if they don't follow what you teach? So that's what we're going to talk about today. What do they do when, you don't, when they don't follow what you teach? So l- turn with me to the book of Ephesians chapter 6. We already quoted part of this verse. In Ephesians chapter 6, notice here in verse 1, Children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is right. Honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise, that it may be well with you and you may live long on the earth. And you fathers, do not provoke your children to wrath, but bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. So there's an admonition here that children are to obey their parents. It talks about the commandment, but also fathers don't provoke your children to wrath. That is, don't push them so hard that you exasperate them. That's another definition of the word there in the Greek, that you exasperate them, that you you bring them to this point where it's not working. You have to go into this with a heart and a plan when you bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. What is the goal for that child? Because as a parent, you can't be emotional about what they do or don't do when they obey or disobey. You have to be thinking is what is our purpose here? And what is it? We are stewards for the children of God. As parents, we get these little human beings made in our image and likeness that God has made in his image and likeness, and we're to care for them and bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord that they would come to know God as their father. And so we have this precious time with them, and the goal is that we bring them up in the training and admonition that God would have them be walking in so they have a relationship with God. That's the goal in our parenting. So as parents, we need to realize that all the things that we talked about last time of teaching and instruction or the previous time about the foundation of forgiveness in the family in Jesus Christ, we are giving them a vision. Where are they headed? Where are they going? Where does this walk take them? And why do we teach and believe the things that we do? Because God has called us. He has given us the revelation that We were created to be glorified, that we are heading from dust to glory through Jesus Christ. And that as God has called us, God is calling them to be a part of this thing. So the calling is to you and to your children and all who are afar off, as it says in Acts chapter 2, 38 to 40. So we are calling and we are working with our children to this point. So sometimes it's hard when you're parenting because you can get so easily caught in the weeds of the day-to-day stuff. And you can lose sight, but there's a vision that we should be having for our kids. And just like you would in uh, training anybody in anything, you're thinking about the goal. You know, when when I started learning how to play basketball, the goal wasn't just to learn to dribble. The, The goal was to play a game and hopefully win. That was the goal. But you learn all the basic fundamental things so that when you get in the game, you're good at the fundamentals and you have a chance to win. Same thing with child rearing. 
You're teaching them how to do the fundamentals. Be humble, be grateful, show gratitude in life, be kind, be considerate, be thoughtful, be responsible, learn how to work. All these things that go into the package of who God is and what he's revealed to us about his way of life. And so there's all this training that goes in. And so fathers and mothers, you have to be thinking out where are we headed? Because if you're only thinking that it's, I'm gonna baby this baby of mine for the next 20 years, they're probably not gonna be ready for the maturity of adulthood when they get to their 20s. They're still gonna be thinking more like a little child. So part of training is what? The giving of responsibility, the growing of instruction, the giving of liberty, the allowance for success or failure, the allowance for obedience or disobedience because in these moments, now you can train, you can work, you can correct. It's part of the process of life. Whether you're training somebody in a new job or in a sport or you're training somebody in your house, the same kind of principles apply. And so that's what we want to talk a bit about here today. So uh, here, uh, turn over with me to Exodus chapter 20, just to set a foundation here in God's word, because that this is in the commandments, that there is a, a scripture in regard to parenting and the commandments and how children treat their parents. I think it tells us how important it is to God, this, this commandment, this transitionary commandment. And notice how it says here in verse 12 of Exodus 20, honor your father and your mother that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord your God is giving you. So right on the tablets of stone that God etched with his own finger, and right on the tablets of our heart that God etches with his own finger, he's putting in a law about honoring your parents and honoring them that, what, the first commandment of promise, that your days would be long. But notice what it also says here in Exodus chapter 21, 21, and it says here in verse 15, he who strikes his father or mother shall surely be put to death. So how does God feel about kids that hit their parents? Pretty strongly, wouldn't you say? It's, a, it's, it's death. Notice verse 17, and he who curses his father or his mother shall surely be put to death. So I want us to have this foundation of thinking because God was showing from the very beginning, his heart was that children would obey their parents and follow their parents in the Lord, as it says in Ephesians chapter 6 and verse 1. And so this is something that we need to teach our children. Turn with me over to the book of Proverbs now in chapter 29. Proverbs chapter 29. And notice with me here, Proverbs chapter 29 and verse 15. Proverbs 29 and verse 15. So it says here, The rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother a child left to himself. So as I'm talking to us today about children being left to themselves or talking about training up, training up is something where you are engaging in the education and the training of your child. Are you engaged in that process? So see, if we ask ourselves with our children, are we engaged in this process? How are we doing it? What are the things that we're doing in this process. Now, realize that the church asks the same question, right? Because God gave, what, some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some teachers, right? For what? The work of the ministry, the edifying of the body of Christ, right? Till we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ, that we wouldn't be tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, right? But that we would have a unity of faith, that the body would come to edify itself in love, So when you read that in Ephesians 4, realize that God gave gifts to the body so that the bride, the children would be brought forth with teaching, with instruction, with edification. And so it is in the family. The same model being done, there needs to be active engagement in what's happening. And so this can be a wonderful experience, but what happens when things don't go right? It says here again, the rod and rebuke give wisdom, but a child left to himself brings shame to his mother. Now, my daughter uh, is uh, 
teacher. She got her master's degree recently in education. And while she was going to college, she was nannying for a job, which was a good thing. Now, when Bronte was a teenager, she told us, I ain't raising my kids the way you guys did. <laughs> and by that, she met with discipline <laughs> when things didn't go well. But what was a really great experience was for her to go nanny and see what happens when parents leave their children alone and they don't discipline them when they're misbehaving and when they're not answering and not listening. And so it was great because she came back and said, um, I am going to do it your way. <laughs> Because she saw, she saw the fruit of it. And ultimately, this, is a, this proverb is very true. And in the same way as we as a church are to be bringing the word of God to you and saying, this is what the Lord says, this is what we should do. We give that instruction and we bring it to, to pass in, in teaching, encouraging, exhorting. So also, does a parent need to be engaged? So the first thing that I would encourage you as a parent having a plan don't stick your head in the sand to what's going on. You can't just let your kids to themselves and not be engaged in the process. Now, this is one of the things that can happen in, in any life, but when you have children, just realize that whatever you need to do to bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord is what you need to do. So sometimes that means you can't keep living the way you lived before you had kids. In fact, a lot of that changes. It all changes. So accept the fact that it's going to be different. And pour yourself into loving that kid and thinking about what it needs to be done. So as we talked about it first, that's full control, right? You always have to be safeguarding where that child is. And so we've even made announcements here. Hey, don't let your little kids just run around. If you parents think that you can just, you know, be fellowshipping in here and your three, four-year-old's out running around... That's probably not a good idea. You need to be conscientious of where they are and what they're doing because you are their guardian. You are their protector. You are the one that's watching their behavior and seeing what they're doing. So be engaged in the process. It's so important to not leave your kids to, to themselves, and especially as they're young and you're working with them to train them and what to do. So get engaged with your kids at the very earliest of ages and, and pay attention to what their behavior is. Let's turn over uh, just uh, another verse here, uh, Proverbs 29, 17, actually same chapter here. It says, correct your son and he will give you rest. Yes, he will give delight to your soul. Now notice the next verse, where there is no revelation or it could be like a vision, a prophetic revelation, the people cast off restraint, but happy is he who keeps the law. Well, doesn't that seem kind of interesting? Where there is no vision, there's, there's no keeping of the law. The, the people cast off restraint of what you do. So one of the things as we talk about having a parental vision is where are we headed to? And again, as the church, where are we going? Seeking first the kingdom of God and all his righteousness, right? That's the vision. Till we all come to the measure of the stature of the fullness of Christ. Be you therefore holy as your Father in heaven is holy. Be you therefore perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. The, by the blood of Christ, Revelation 1 says, we have been sanctified that we would be kings and priests to our God and his Christ. There's a vision there of what we're doing and why. That vision of where we're going corrects our behavior today. Why do we do the things that is in this book? Well, God wants us going someplace, and he gives us this word and commandment, this instruction to lead us and guide us in that way. Same thing, parents. Bring back to your kids where you're taking them, where they're being headed by the teaching of God. So correct your son, and he will give you rest, and he will give delight to your soul. So just know that there's a blessing for you parents in this too when, when you engage in this process of being engaged with your kids and correcting them. Now turn back to chapter 3 of Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Notice here in verse 11. Proverbs 3 and verse 11 it says, My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord nor detest his correction. For whom the Lord loves, he corrects, just as a father, the son in whom he delights. 
So when you think about your role as a parent, I want you to realize that the role that we are laying out in this series of sermons, and even here today when we're talking about discipline and correction, it's the role that God already is playing, and he's wanting us to model it in our families. We're not creating something new or original here. What we're doing is we're looking at the example of a father in heaven who is working with us and working with our kids. But notice that it says, my son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor detest his correction. Now, how many kids that you know of when they're little that are wanting to do something that they've been told not to, that get caught doing it, how many feel really good when the parent catches them? Like they just say, thank you, dad and mom. Thank you for correcting me. I didn't really want those cookies, right? I didn't really want to get into that place. Do you, do your parents find that at your house? Not so much. So let's just take a moment here and pause. Would you want your kid to? Would you want your kid, if you were correcting them on bad behavior, to say, you're right, I shouldn't be doing that. Thanks, Dad. Right, Greg? Your house, you'd like that, right? Yeah, that would be nice. It would be so much more pleasant if you said, you really need to stop, and they're like, Dad, you are so right about that. <laughs> yes, you're right. I stopping right now. Yes, the perfect son, right? How many times did that happen in the Liesenfeld house? Yeah, I don't really recall that. It's just, I, you know, maybe some good attempts later. But the reality is that's not the response. So I said that when we're learning about parenting, we're going to be learning how to be good children as well. How many times when the Lord corrects you, are you saying, thanks, Dad, I needed that. See, the more mature we become, the more willing to listen to correction we should be. Maturity is saying, I acknowledge that I'm not right. In humility, I should listen to what other people say, God says, I should evaluate it. Who am I to think that I'm not in the wrong? Who am I to think that I couldn't have messed up? Who am I to think that I might have misunderstood, misbehaved, have done something? So you see, as we here as Christians today are children of God, the instruction that God is giving to us, he's teaching us something about ourselves. Just as our own children don't like to be corrected, guess who else doesn't like to be corrected? We parents who are God's kids. And ultimately he's saying, yes, learn from this. How would you want your kid to be? How would you want your child to respond to the correction? Would you want them to listen to it and take it and say, you know what, Dad, you did tell me that before, and I wasn't following, I need to stop what I'm doing and follow what you said. How much different is life in that kind of setting when someone's willing to repent, when someone's willing to be corrected? You know what God says? If you would judge yourself, you would not need to be judged. If you would listen to what I'm teaching and do what it says, correct your behavior according to my word, I don't need to come down on you. I, I, I'm bringing you back to me, back to my ways. Why? Because he wants to bless us with eternal life, and that life is not just about consciousness. It's about fellowship and unity of walking together. Can two walk together unless they be agreed? See, the way God wants us to walk is the way that he walks because in it there is what? Love patience, kindness, right? There is joy. There is every form of blessing and prosperity. He's wanting that for us all. But unfortunately, sometimes we grab in selfishness, thinking we'll have blessing, and we don't. We try to get into the cookie jar. But that's not the right time for that, or maybe that's not even the right thing for you to be eating. And so basically, let's hear the word to us children of God here today. Are we taking the correction of the Lord or the correction that a brother brings to us with the listening ear and the patience that we would want our own kids to? Because that's the ideal that God is teaching us in this part of our parenting. Now let's turn over here to uh, Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13. Proverbs chapter 13 and verse 24. He who spares his rod hates his son. He who spares his rod hates his son. 
But he who loves him disciplines him promptly. All right, kids, how many of you, and this is for you adults, how many of your parents really loved you? I mean, really loved you. They did not spare at all. There was no hatred from those parents, right? They loved in abundance. I can remember three times my parents really loved me. Three times. Still to this day, I, I was not even, I think I might have been five for one of these, but three times from the age of three to five, I got it. And I can still remember it because it hurt. My parents did not spare the rod. My dad, the first time in church. Now listen, in church in those days, kids could sit anywhere in a church and you could have heard a mouse squeak because kids were quiet. And growing up where I did, my dad sat right where Juan is here in the second row and little Davey Liesenfeld was right down the aisle there on the floor playing with quiet toys, just sitting there. And I remember getting noisy one day. I started making noises for my toys, right? They started interacting with each other, and I was the voice of all this. You know, the narrator voice comes in. And I remember my dad saying, shush, be quiet. Well, I knew what be quiet meant. And I remember looking at him, and I just kept doing what I was doing. Because, hey, I'm in church, and what are you going to do here? <laughs> right? Oh. So I did it again. He warned me, and then my mom was between us, and she said, David, you be quiet now. Third time, I was noisy. Dad grabbed me, walked me straight out that aisle, took me to a place in the back of the church that was private, and he gave me the spanking I can remember to this day because it hurt. I mean, it was the first time he really had laid into me, I think, because I can't remember any time earlier, but I remember it hurt. And, you know, it wasn't just that I was making noise in church. It was that when he told me what to do, I remember ignoring, like, whatever. And, you know, and basically, he let me know whatever wasn't going to work. <laughs> whatever didn't work in that house. I realized that at that moment. How many times do you think that when we went to the second row of church, I was noisy again? Never. Because whatever became ever, I was quiet. Dad, you can see I'm not talking, right? That's the way it was. It trained me well. And even to this day, I'm still pretty quiet in church. I'll be like, you know, Bronte will be talking. Say, shh, 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 be too loud. Be too loud. Shh. Right? It's, it's ingrained in my mind. Shh, be quiet. Listen up. The second time, I remember my sister and I were told not to turn the water on outside because we were making the, wa uh, the bushes all muddy and the mud was like flowing over into the sidewalk and onto the driveway because we were playing in the water in the mud. And so my dad said, don't do it. So guess what we did? We did it. It was a hot day in Illinois and we went out there and we turned the water on. And of course, you know, being dumb kids, not that old, I think my sister was about... Uh, eight or nine years old, I was four or five, get called, did you turn the water on? No. We just didn't realize the concept of evidence yet. We just, we didn't get it that the mud on the sidewalk and the driveway was clear evidence to the fact that yes, we had done it. And so, of course, it comes out, right? And my dad, because when I said no, I don't remember what my sister did, but my dad looked, he said, David, did you just lie to me? And I was like, maybe, and he just grabbed me, took me to the bathroom, closed the door, put the seat of the toilet down, sat me down, and I can still remember the sting of that spanking. It was just so painful, it was just like, I couldn't escape it. How many times do you think I lied to my dad again? No, it just, it cured me. I didn't want that anymore. That was painful. He totally took authority to teach me what was wrong. It just wasn't something I, I, I was like, no. And I became a really bad liar. I, I became a bad liar in all situations in life because I just couldn't do it. So it's just better just to tell the truth and get in trouble. Take your lumps while you get them because lying just didn't seem like a viable option. It just wasn't good. Third time was my mom. I'm home with my mom, and we live in a nice neighborhood, and I got friends in the neighborhood that are 
three, four, five. I was in kindergarten at the time, so I remember I got off from kindergarten, which was morning, came home in the afternoon, and I wanted to go play with my friend Carrie Lanou across the street. So I did, except I left the house and didn't tell my mother, who had told me repeatedly when I had done this in the past, don't you ever leave this house without telling me where you're going. So mom realizes I'm gone at some point. I don't know. She starts looking for me. She finds me at the Lanou's house. They send me home, and I walk into that house, and man, I didn't know my mom had it in her. I mean, she let me have it. She just, she gave me a spanking. I must have cried a half an hour after that spanking. It hurt so bad. But I remember the principle of it. It was so wrong of me, inconsiderate of me, wasn't thinking of my mother, wasn't following her word. I deserved it. Now, I tell you that today because really, that's about it. I don't remember a lot more than that. I'm sure I did have other spankings. But the three spankings that I can remember in my life, they have impacted me to this day. I think about these things because my parents made it important. You will be obedient and not ignore my word. You will tell the truth and be honest and follow me. And you will be considerate and follow my instruction. And I still try to live that way today because my parents taught me that any violation of that was really wrong. And so what is this word saying to us? He who spares the rod hates his kid. Why? Because do you want your kid to grow up being inconsiderate? Do you want your kid to grow up being a liar? Do you want to train them how wrong these things are? That doesn't mean you're going to be a cure-all for sin or that your discipline is going to stop them from ever lying again because I have. Have I been inconsiderate? Yes, I have. Have I said, done things I don't wish I didn't? Yes, I have. But the reality is there is a way in me, and there was a training of conscience of how to behave myself with my parents and how honoring my parents was important And you realize to me, as I think about that training in my early years, I know it affects the way I read the word of God today. I know it does. It it blessed me to tremble at God's word. So that at the age of 15, I could read in the word about the commandment of the Sabbath. And though my father wasn't following it, I would say, "But, but my father says, remember the Sabbath to keep it holy. I feel like I should because he told me to. And my life was turned upside down. So ultimately, coming into this word and reading it now, the impact that you have is setting a cultural foundation of honoring your parents. Why did God make it one of the commandments? It's essential in your psychology. And see, the thing is, when we have parenting, and maybe you had parents that were not faithful to discipline, that were not faithful to correct, were not faithful to teach or instruct in God's ways, or not faithful to keep their own word, maybe that's where you are today. You're still battling the things that happened in your own childhood. Maybe your father or your mother weren't as attentive to you or teaching you or instructing you in God's ways. So you might be facing more of that today. But ultimately, what is God wanting us to do? Get back to the purity of heart. So what do we have to do? We have to humble ourselves and say, God, if, if I'm not following you, Please correct me as gently as you can. But don't let me go astray too long. Because I need to be following you and near you. Wake me up if I'm not saying. And you see, as a parent, that's the way. You don't start with the hard spanking. You don't start even with any kind of spanking. You start with teaching. You show them the way. You make sure they understand the way. And then you escalate from there. You should never punish your kid if they don't understand. Sometimes I see parents, and they'll they'll take action with their kids, but their kid doesn't seem to understand what they did wrong. Just make sure your kids understand. You should do that. You can't go in and start spanking a kid who doesn't understand. When our kids were little, Stephanie and I, I was trying to remember, did did we ever discipline our kids for being noisy in a church service? I can't, but when they were little, you know what we did? We would take them out because we didn't want to disturb the other people around us, so we would just take our kids out, and we trained them that this isn't isn't proper. This is where we have to take you out now 
but let's go back in and then you can play with your quiet toys. And we always used to have quiet toys for our kids. So, you know, from as soon as they could start sitting, we would have stuff for them to play with that was quiet. So they could be in the service, but they could be engaged or we would train them to take naps or whatever we did. But realize that that point in time, that's not a time when you're gonna be using a rod with your child, okay? So please hear what I'm saying about this. The discipline comes in when they grow older and older and now there's defiance in what they're doing. They understand what they're to do. They know you've given them correction or instruction and they're willfully being disobedient. Now you have to stop that. You can't allow that to persist. If you do, you hate your son or your daughter, right? So you need to love them. And loving correction is something that should become part of your parenting as you see your child willfully disobeying you in the way that they're walking. But modeling can be a much more fun way, parents, to teach your kids. So when Bronte was several months old, she, she went to Roos Chris. And she had a fine steak meal with us, and Grandma shoved ranch dressing in her mouth. It was the first thing she had had besides uh, mom's milk since she was born. It was so weird. I don't know why I'm bringing that up now. But um, weird memories. So, but we trained her to go eat at restaurants with us, and she would be quiet. She never knew anything different. We'd bring her in on her car seat, set it on the table or in the booth, and there she was with the family having a meal. Meal was quiet time. We could talk, but that was it. And so we trained her in different ways, and Eric and Jack the same way. You train, you model. So when we talked about having family dinner time, family dinner time was a great time to train the kids about how you behave at a table versus when we're at the park and we're screaming our heads off, right? Our dad's watching the Bears football game. Woo! Right? Nothing holding back, watching the Eagles beat the Patriots. It was great. So <laughs> I only said that for Cal because he's right here. So... But the, the point of the matter is you, you, you teach and work with your kids and train them in what to do. And remember that there are these times when you will have to, to, to apply something more. Let's turn over now and uh, turn to uh, Proverbs 19, verse 18. Chasten your son while there is hope and do not set your heart on his destruction. What a powerful verse that is. It literally means, do not set your heart literally on him dying. Don't set your heart on him dying. So chasten your son while there is hope. In other words, as you have this little person in your house, train them, instruct them, and correct them when they go astray so that you can bring them to the way that God would have them to walk. But parents, you've got to be engaged in that. You've got to be diligent in the process of training your kids. Turn over with me to 22, chapter 22, Proverbs 22, verse 15. Foolishness is bound up in the heart of a child. The rod of correction will drive it far from him. So just like with us, what is God wanting to do? He's wanting to make us wise, right? So in teaching us wisdom, chastening that we receive is driving out foolishness so we will walk in the ways of the Lord that, that lead to life. And not just for us, but for every member of society. So the good things that God wants us to do, walking with him, following his ways. Chapter 23 here, notice here in verse 13. Do not withhold correction from a child. If you... Beat him or discipline him with a rod, he will not die. You shall discipline him with a rod and deliver his soul from hell. So let's talk a little bit about this corporal punishment. First of all, child abuse is something I have to talk about if we're going to talk about physical correction, physical discipline. Because at no point when the, the word is speaking about this subject does it talk about injuring your kid or beating them so they can't walk right anymore or bringing them to that point. If you are doing that, you probably belong in jail. Not probably, you do. If you're abusing a kid to, to produce injury in their life by punching them, kicking them, choking them, throwing them against the wall, whatever people of violence want to do, that's not, that's not raising a child, and that's not proper discipline. 
And if you've been raised in a house like that, you know that's not love. A child should know love and know the discipline of love that comes from a father who loves and cares enough to say, I can't, I can't let you get away with this. So where does it start? It doesn't start with being physical with your kid at all. That is the last resort. That's what you don't want to have to get to. It starts with correction, counsel, redirection, training. And then as they're little and they start to understand, just one little quick slap on the back of a hand generally provides enough staying. I, I, I don't know if I can tell this story because I don't have the permission, but, I'll, but I'm going to do it anyway. So, <laughs> God forgive me. But I, it was so cute last week because uh, we had Dusty and Janelle over, and there were these devices that, you know, one push of a button and all the power goes out. And so we were talking about it, and Ollie was real close to it, and, and, and Dusty said no, and he stopped, and he understood to stop, but then he went back to it. And when he went to do it, Dusty immediately went over, and the, the scripture says discipline promptly. He basically slapped the back of his hand. You could see, ow, oh, that's strong, Dad. No more. So then I see him later and say, no. What's he do? Turns and walks away. Doesn't touch the thing. I'm like, Dusty, it worked right in front of my eyes, man. I was like, that was awesome, you know? Did you know I was talking about that this week? But to watch him, like, engage with, with, with Ali and he, he was prompt to do it. Ali knew he had done something wrong. Now he had received the, the punishment. There, there it was. It, it wasn't more than that. All he had to do was have a little attention getter to say, ouch, that hurts. I don't want that again. That's it. A spanking comes later in life and when the kids get a little older and they need a spanking because what they did was outside the bounds. Now, in case you're wondering, is spanking legal? Spanking is legal in all 50 states and the District of Columbia. Here's what is defined as child abuse. When you injure or have the intent to injure that child, that you're not using it as a form of discipline, but in anger, rage, you're basically looking to hurt a child. If your intention is to injure a child. If you are spanking a child or slapping the back of their hand and now they can't use their hand, you're not doing it right. All you're trying to do is basically sting so that they get the point. And that lasts about five seconds. Spanking's pain will last a little longer, especially if you use a little wooden paddle. And yes, legal in all 50 states. Okay? So if the law's changed, then you need to abide by what? Well, I'm not trying to put anybody in jail, but I did research this this week with this year's laws to make sure that we're all good in this message. Because the Word of God says that basically you need to bring them to this pain lest they go to a worse thing. You bring them this to prevent that. Okay? I've cried every time I've, not every time I spank my kids, but with every child that grew up in my house. Because a father who loves his kid, doesn't like to do that. At least I, I didn't like that pleasure of seeing them get hurt. So, but I needed to do it because I wanted them to change going on. And so again, what are you doing? You're making it sting. You're making it hurt, but you're not injuring. My kids weren't left with bruise marks. Red behinds, yes, for a while. But not that there was any lasting discoloration or mark or injury because that was not the intent. And if you ever get mad because your child's disobeying you and you're going to give them a speech, I would just say, take a breath. Remember what you're doing and why because this isn't about you being angry. This is about you training them in the way of the Lord and this is a punishment and you need to detach yourself from the anger of the disobedience to render the judgment and righteousness. Okay, take a breath. You know, I say do it promptly, but not if you can't control yourself in, in your anger. You need to take a breath. So I'm going to tell you about the hardest spanking I ever gave. And this one belongs to Eric. Bronte might say, no, Dad, it belongs to me, but it doesn't, because I was the giver. I know which one got the worst one. But Eric was in a place in his life where we had caught him taking things that didn't belong to him. 
in our house and then hiding them or eating them or using them. And, you know, somehow Jack's candy jar just kept getting lower and lower all the time. Okay, so what's going on? Somebody's taking his candy. Something's going on here. So all of a sudden, money's missing. That's not a good thing. Now money's missing. Bronte, did you take it? No. Eric? No. Jack? No. So you never did anything wrong. So it's like, <laughs> so at least what I thought. So, you know, you, you go through, listen, all right, so now we know something's going on in the house. Well, then we were at a very dear friend's house. And we didn't know it, but took some money from our friend. And we found it because Stephanie found a bunch of money in his closet. Where's, a, I think he was maybe eight. Stephanie was about eight at the time. Where'd the money come from? So, obviously, we got the facts, we do the questioning, he had lied about it, and eventually through questioning persistence, the truth comes out, and yep, indeed, there was some money missing from the friend, and we had it all confirmed, and now what do you do? We caught him multiple times, stealing, lying, now he has taken it outside of our house. Got to lay the hammer down on that. So Eric got the hardest spanking I ever gave. I used a little wooden paddle, and I, I let him have it. Stinging him, wasn't trying to injure him, was no intent to bruise him, just the flick of that spoon, though, on that bear behind, and it hurts. So I asked Eric this morning. I said, you remember, you know, that story? Yeah. <laughs> you remember? You remember that spanking good, huh? Yeah. So how's it going? Are you stealing from people or lying? No, Dad. Like, that's like not a thing. And what I will say is, Eric tells the truth to his own hurt a lot. I mean, it's, he, it's not, I'm not saying he's a perfect kid and he doesn't ever uh, tell fibs or lies. But what I will say is, he's an honest kid and he is generally tells the truth to his parents even when what he did wasn't a good thing and he knows his parents will be upset with him when we say, did you do this thing? And then he admits it. And so where he is today as a young man is he's continuing to grow in his honesty and continuing to grow in the way he's living his life. But I can look back at that and say, this was becoming a real habit in his life. What if I had just ignored it? What if I had just let it go? What if I wasn't going to be consistent and, and make him pay the price? for what he did. And so not only did he get the spanking, he had to apologize to us, to our friend from whom he took the money, and then he had to pay back plus, not just what he stole, he, we, we, we made him pay a bonus back because he needed to learn a lesson that you don't steal money from other people. And you know, that's what God said, right? If you steal a lamb, you pay back, what, fourfold. You don't just pay back the one, you pay back four. So. There was, a, there was a, a benefit to him. But you see, the pain that that caused him, the financial loss, the shame, the embarrassment, and the physical pain, all attributed to something that we hope will be a, a lasting lesson in his life, that he will associate that with that pain, that loss. And that is what God wants us to see and understand about all sin. See, God lets us face our own problems. He gives us enough liberty to make choices, but then we are faced with the consequence of the decisions that we make. And in so doing, he chastens us to say, here's the way of life that lead to blessing. Here's the way of sin and cur that leads to cursing. You can have either one. Choose life, he says, right? Because I don't want to see you punished. But if you choose this, you will be punished punished because God loves us and because he's saying you can't live that way without inflicting pain so you're going to feel the pain of it therefore choose life it's better to be kind it's better to be loving it's better to be gentle right it's better to be honest it's better to be giving it's better to cheer when your friend gets something instead of being jealous of what they've got right don't put any gods before God keep Obey the true God. 
Worship him in spirit and truth. See, all these things lead to life. And here's the thing about God's way. And this is why it's so exciting what we teach our kids and what God teaches us in the church. Do you realize that the way God teaches us can go on and on and on and on forever without causing pain, suffering, death? Don't you think that's cool? He figured it out. He, he's cracked the code. If, if people are trying to figure out what brings happiness, disobeying God doesn't bring happiness. Sexual immorality doesn't bring happiness. Lying and cheating and stealing doesn't bring happiness. Gambling and taking weak people's money because you're smarter than them doesn't bring happiness. Following God's ways brings happiness. And it's repeatable for everybody. You see, the way of sin, even if you think you're getting ahead because you got money, because you stole it from somebody, you just say, what does that leave? What is the consequence of the environment? You hurt somebody else to do it. And that is the way of Satan, and that is the way of evil, and that is the way that we're rooting out of our children the foolishness to think that somehow being sexually immoral or going after vices or going after the things of this world, that that will somehow bring happiness to life. That's foolishness. It doesn't. Because if it's not hurting you, it's hurting somebody else. And ultimately, it's hurting society and the environment. And what do you see in this world? You know, it, it is said, and I think it's true, we live at the safest time in humanity because there's a lot of civilized nations that aren't fighting with each other. And yet, do you know that the slaves that are out there now... More slavery than ever in this world. More slaves than ever. Does that make you happy? Do you see what that is? If we are living because somebody else is a slave, if I, have to, I can buy a cheaper shirt because there's some little kid that's working in a sweatshop somewhere not being paid, you see, that's wrong. That's evil. That's sin. That doesn't work in God's government. God doesn't abuse little children. And he doesn't make sex slaves for people. And he doesn't go about stealing, injuring, and where the smarter or the ones that can scheme better take advantage of those who are simple and don't know that they're being ripped off by their governments or by their corporations or by whoever else. And you see, what we're really talking about here when we talk about raising our kids and we talk about who we are as a church, we are talking about the kingdom of God, understanding the ways of Almighty God, to know that when Jesus Christ returns as King of kings and Lord of lords, he's not coming up with a new set of rules. The rules are in our hands. And what he's doing is training kings and priests who will look at these rules, who will live by these rules, and who will train their kids by these rules. So that's what he's wanting from us. This is much higher than just, are we saved? Have we jumped through that? We're going to be conscious with God forever. Because God is saying, there's so much more than conscious. I made you to be my kids. And that you saints would take the rule for out, throughout, for wherever. The promise in the book of Daniel is what? That he will deliver the kingdom to his saints, they will always have it, and the government will be on Jesus' shoulders, it will always be. And of the increase of his government and of his peace, there will be no end. So when you think about what you're raising your kids to be, you're raising them to be members of the kingdom of God forever. You're teaching them to seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. That is your responsibility as a parent. And I put that responsibility on you. Now remember what I said in the first sermon, all souls are mine, says the Lord. The sins of the son will not affect the righteous father. The sins of the father will not affect the righteous son. The Lord's ways are fair. Everyone will have to choose their own way. But parents, we are to be guiding our children's choices as long as we have authority over them in our houses. And that is one of the things that's so beautiful that when the child comes out, who has the full care? The parent. Who has to take charge and authority? The parent. They're not ready to be on their own making those decisions yet. You're given time to teach to model, to show the ways, to lead to Christ. And so we do that. And so when zero to two, you're not gonna be engaging in spanking disciplines, generally speaking. You're, it's, you're teaching, you're encouraging, you're instructing, and you'll know when the time is when they finally get it, and you see the little light bulb in their head, and you know they understand, and they are rebellious toward you or disobey you, 
then you take your little first hand slap and you, you start that right there. You let them know that that will be punished in this house. But here's the thing, parents. You have to take authority over your children or you will have the terrible twos, threes, fours, fives, sixes. As long as you let it go, you can expect it to be pretty terrible because the child that was saying, you're at my beck and call, I'm hungry, wah, right? Feed me. And he changed, wah. Here comes parents running. They can easily, as John Roseman said, think they're the ones in charge. They're like the little gods, right? And you're the servant running around them, doing all the service. And then at some point, as they get old enough, you've got to say, well, wait a second now. I'm, I love you, and I'm going to serve you, but I'm the parent. And parents, you've got to be parents. Don't abdicate that responsibility to parent your kids. A person who loves their child will discipline them. Turn over, let's finish here in Hebrews chapter 12. Hebrews chapter 12. So it says here in verse 5, And you have forgotten the exhortation which speaks to you as to sons. My son, do not despise the chastening of the Lord, nor be discouraged when you are rebuked by him. For whom the Lord loves, he chastens and scourges every son whom he receives. Did you hear that? So when we get scourged or we feel chastening of the Lord, what's our natural thing? Why would God allow this to happen to me? Why would you do that to me? Why would I be inflicted with this pain? Why would this happen? We're, we're like the little kid who is getting in trouble for what father said don't do, and, and we're feeling the pain of it. So think about that. Think about this in your life. As Christians, think about the application of this that God is trying to teach us. He's not doing this because he hates us. He's doing this because he loves us. And we will do it to our children because we love them and they're going to respond with immaturity. Let us not respond with immaturity. Let us grow up from this lesson. So if you endure chastening, God deals with you as sons. For what son is there whom a father does not chasten? But if you are without chastening, of which all have become partakers, then you're illegitimate and not sons. So if you, if you don't want God to chasten you, then just say, I don't want to be your kid. But if I'm going to be your kid, make me like you. And if you're, he's going to make you like him, there's going to be a need for chastening and correction. Furthermore, we have had human fathers who corrected us, and we paid them respect. Shall we not much more readily be in subjection to the father of spirits and live? Have you noticed this spirit in the world? It didn't used to be this way. Now we all question God's authority. Who are you, God, to do this? Who are you, God, to allow this? Who are you? He's God. And he's God who loves you. But we become immature in our thinking. We have made God the genie in the bottle that he should let us do whatever we want, as immoral as it might be, but if anything bad's going on, we blame him for it. Where is that thinking? How immature is that? So let us be spiritually mature and learn this lesson. For they indeed, verse 10, for a few days chastened us as seemed best to them, but he, what? For our profit because he has an eternal plan for us and a vision, that we may be what? Partakers of his holiness. Now, no chastening seems to be joyful for the present. We can agree on that. It hurts, but painful. Nevertheless, afterward, it yields the peaceable fruit of righteousness to those who have been trained by it. There are a lot of sick thoughts in this world that have been planted by the evil one that want to undermine the honor and authority of God our Father. And the thoughts go along the lines of not just questioning where is God or how could a loving God allow this to happen or that to happen, but it goes even deeper than that into the very nature of children. And basically the thought, in it, and I remember watching it as a kid, even in movies back in the 80s, there's this thought that somehow you are independent from your parents. You don't need to listen to your parents. You should make up your own mind about things and go independent of your parents and not follow in their ways because, you know, they're your parents and they're not you. Well, who, who thought that thought first? Who, who rebelled against the Father in heaven first? 
Who came up with the idea that I don't have to listen to you? You see, there's a sick thought in this that is indoctrinated into our society that children somehow shouldn't follow their parents. Let me tell you this, kids, because I've seen this, and it's, and it's happening more and more. I ask you this. You may not have everything figured out yet. Me neither. All right? Me neither. But here's the thing. If you can't disprove what your parents are teaching you, in that they're teaching you there's a God, and maybe you know or not, but you can't disprove them, or they're teaching you about a way of love and the word of God, and you're not sure yet, but you can't disprove, why don't you stick with what your parents said, because they love you, until you see something different? You see, parents, we should be giving kids time to think. We want them to think. We're, we're not training mindless people. But kids, also honor your parents and realize that unless you prove something opposite and, and really can take it and make a case, why not just honor your parents? You see, God in the scriptures talks about this. What, they do what the parents say. He said, why don't my own kids do what I say? These people are nomadic. They've always been nomadic because their parents told them. And God is saying, I've given you my ways that are perfect, yet you won't follow me. And so think about it, young people. Why not follow the way of your parents until you've proven there is a better way indeed? But I always say this, if your parents aren't asking you to sin, if they're not asking you to hurt anybody, they're not asking you to do anything that's against God, why not just roll with it? It makes life a lot easier when we roll with those that have authority in our lives by doing what they say. So parents, teach your kids God's ways. Be fair. Don't provoke them to wrath. Bring them up in the training and admonition of the Lord. And children, listen to your parents and obey your parents in the Lord. Parents, engage with your kids and make sure you're involved in teaching them and disciplining when they go astray. And children, realize your parents love you. They're showing you the way of God. They're showing you the truth. And they're showing you the right ways. That's their heart. They love you. Your parents are not against you. They're for you. And God says that he will send the spirit of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the children to the fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. We can only manage this in our own families, in this church, right here where we are. But let it be evident here and let it grow from here and out of this place. May the glory of the Lord shine in your lives, in your marriages, in your families, in your friendships, and in your relationships. And may God bless you to be his child, to love his correction, to know he only does it because he loves you, because he is a God who has designed an eternal life for you and me, that we can have it and enjoy it with him for all eternity. Let's praise him.